Happy International Women's Day, everybody, and Tony here with a review of Maya Bez Les Zugeno with conductor Alexander Vedernikov, which I saw at the Deutsche Oper Berlin. It's been three years and four months since I last saw this particular opera, and my main reason for going back to this production of Les Zugeno by David Alden was because one month ago, Liv Redpath, who is a soprano whose career I've been following for two years, made her role debut as La Reine Marguerite de Valois, a.k.a. La Reine Margot. And joining her were Anton Rosicki as Rodonangy and Dimitri Stiliakos as Le Comte de Neve. So since it's International Women's Day, I will gladly kick off this review by talking about Live Red Path as Marguerite de Valois. I've been following her career for two years ever since I first heard about her when she was an understudy as Olympia from the LA Opera's production of Le Comte of Mann by Offenbach. And as I saw her career go from doing a lot of the small roles such as Barbarina from Le Nozze di Figaro and La Contessa Ceprano from Rigoletto, I was quite intrigued in terms of how her career was going to blossom, especially when I heard a snippet of her on YouTube singing Anon Credeia from Bellini's La Sonambula. My initial thoughts on her voice was that it was decent, not too exciting nor too bland. It was just there in my opinion. However, as I heard and saw her live, I was quite blown away with how she was able to become better, not only as a singer, but also as a singing actress from when I first heard and saw her on YouTube. She managed to not only navigate the high notes with pure abandon, but also navigate the lower notes with a sufficient amount of plushness and with such beauty that I was completely amazed at what she was able to pull off as Marguerite de Valois. But if you know me, I always prefer a true dramatic coloratura soprano singing this particular queen. Voices that come into my mind are the likes of Frida Hempel, Luisa Tetrazzini, and of course, my personal favorites, Joan Sutherland, Christiane Edapierre, Rita Shane, Anik Massy, Laura Aiken, and Marlis Petersen. With Liv Redpath singing the role of Marguerite de Valois, I was initially skeptical because most of her repertoire revolves around the lyric coloratura and light lyric soprano repertoires especially since she has been specializing in roles such as Cerbinetta from Ariadne of Naxos and Olympia from Le Comte of Man. But hearing her as La Reine Margot made me realize just how much of a brilliant future Miss Redpath has. The potential that she has in her voice is there, all thanks to the discipline, diligence, and the absolute beauty in her style she was able to emit both as a singer and as an actress. As a singer she managed to embrace that huge gamut necessary in terms of range whether it's those sparkling high notes or the chest tones that she managed to sing so solidly and in terms of her skills as an actress she was able to make La Reine Margot very coquettish lovely and girlish in her first appearance and in the later parts of the opera she becomes a whole lot more poised dignified and absolutely regal until the final moments of the opera where she can no longer keep her dignity and stature but ends up going rather bonkers in terms of the bloodshed she has witnessed in St. Bartholomew's Square. When all is said and done, 
Liv Redpath definitely stole the show as Marguerite de Valois. And while I did like how she was able to navigate both the high notes and the low notes, her voice could be a whole lot more opulent. It could be a whole lot clearer and it could be a whole lot more multidimensional if she continues to take advantage of those chest tones and also keep her head voice and chest voice well coordinated, not only for the low and middle notes, but also for the high notes as well. There is a future for Miss Redpath in roles such as the Queen of the Night from the Zauberflöte, Constanze from the Entführung aus dem Serail, Donna Anna from Don Giovanni, Fiordeligi from Cosi Fan Tutte, Elvira from I Puritani, Amina from La Sonambula, Beatrice di Tenda, Madama Cortese, Matilde from Guillaume Tell, Antonia from Le Comte of Man, Isabel from Robert le Diable, Amalia from Imas Nadieri, Violetta Valeri from La Traviata, Lucia di La Mermur, Rosmonda di Inghilterra, Emilia di Liverpool, Zdenka from Arabella, and even the likes of Lacme, di Nora, Melisande from Peleas et Melisande, and Catherine from L'Etoile du Nord. The possibilities for Liv Redpath in terms of of her future repertoire are absolutely endless. And it's all thanks to the dedication she was able to give as a fine singing actress with a brilliant future ahead of her. Anton Rosicki might have been solid in terms of how he was able to jump in Roy Lunangy's shoes and make him an absolutely charismatic figure, especially when he hit all those high notes, whether it be a C or a C sharp, a D, or even an E flat. He definitely had that instrument which proved that he can be a very flexible singer. However, if there is one caveat that marred his performance as this hero, it had to be the nasality found in his voice and the fact that he has been singing way too much in the mask and in the nose and also that nasal twang, especially when he sings his French vowels, which sound really unpleasant to listen to. When listening to his voice, I get the feeling that it still needs a whole lot more development in the middle and the lower range, more specifically the chest tones, because there were times that his chest tones, especially his duet with Valentin, came off as a bit whispery and not all that fully spoken. Ported. This is also due in fact that I have in my ears a lot of favorite and who I consider to be the greatest Roi de Langis ever. And those include Giacomo Lauri Volpi, Tony Ponce, and Franco Corelli, who were the greatest spinto tenors who had excellent control of their voices and they managed to sail the high notes with enough chest and strength in their voices as well as having very well supported low notes aka chest tones. Mr. Rosicki definitely has a long way to go and he should definitely take notes from not only the likes of Giacomo Lauri Volpi, Tony Ponce, and Franco Corelli but also Neil Shikoff Jerry Hadley, Benjamin Gigli, Gustav Butio, Roy Jobin, Enrico Caruso, Tito Schippa, Roberto Alagna in the early parts of his career, Giorgio Merigi, Gianfranco Cecchelle, and many other great full lyric and or spinto tenors who had excellent techniques. He definitely needs to take note of what they're doing to their voices, how they manage the high notes and the low notes, so that he can get a better idea of how to make his notes and his voice ring more effectively. 
because as I stated before, I always love it when a spinto tenor or even a full lyric tenor sings the role of Roy de Nancy. It needs to be heroic while also singing as lyrically as possible. Without the heroic quality, you might as well not sing this role at all. And that heroism reflects in that steely quality, whether any tenor hits the high notes or even has those full chest tones. That steeliness and that metal, as well as that ringing quality, that squillo, all need to be there. They all need to be omnipresent in any tenor who sings this challenging role. In spite of my gripes I had with Anton Rosicki singing the role of Rodemangy, I still have to give him a fair amount of credit for bringing in a fair amount of charisma, charm, and likability to this character, even though I would have loved for him to be a lot more heroic, macho, and all blood and guts reflected in that steeliness. He's got a long way to go to especially improve the overall quality of his voice because I do not want his voice to go anytime soon. If he can endeavor to improve the chest tones and really work in the pharynx and not in the mask or in the nose, he can definitely become a whole lot better as long as he especially takes tips and tricks from the likes of Neil Shekhoff and Jerry Hadley, just to name a few awesome lyric and spinto tenors, so that he can become better than he already is. Dimitri Stiliakos was really good as Le Comte de Neve. Unfortunately, who I have in my ears in terms of baritones who have sung Le Comte de Neve, let alone a couple of bass baritones, are the likes of Charles Cambon, Giuseppe Tadei, and one of my personal favorites, Vladimiro Gansaroli, who himself was a bass baritone who also specialized in a fair amount of baritonal roles. Those gentlemen had richer, deeper, fuller, and darker sounding voices that screamed masculinity, virility, and that macho quality that I love in many a baritone. With Dimitri Stiliakos, he still had that masculine quality to be found in his voice. However, there were times that I would have loved his voice to be a whole lot chestier and really work with the pharynx instead of having those moments where he was singing in the mask. Because there were times that as much as I enjoyed his high notes, I felt like they could have had that ringing quality that I love when any baritone hits a high note. And he could have also worked with more chest tones and a whole lot more chest voice so that his voice can become truly powerful. Because this is a baritone I have been following mainly by name. And I was quite impressed with the length and width of his repertoire, considering that he has sung the likes of Don Giovanni as well as Macbeth and Il Conte di Luna. So when I heard him live, he definitely had a fine instrument, but it can be a whole lot better, especially when he endeavors to work more with the chest tones and sing more in the pharynx so that his voice can truly bloom. Striking again as Valentine de saint prix was Olesya Golovneva, and I thought that she was a whole lot better than when I first heard her in the role back in November 2016. Miss Golovneva certainly managed to make her voice ring, especially in the higher register. And more than anything, she continues to be an absolutely dedicated singing actress who was so full of poignancy and so full of womanly charm that I was absolutely amazed at what she had to offer as Valentine. While her voice still had that opulence that I liked about her, it could be a whole lot more opulent if she also continues to work on those chest tones and ensure that 
head voice and chest voice continue to be as coordinated as ever because there were times that she did sing some of her low notes in a collapsed head voice, which should not always be the case. I'm sure that if she keeps improving her chest tones and really manages to dig nice and deep into them, we can definitely have ourselves a full-fledged, full lyric soprano who can sing a lot more Desdemonas from Verdi's Otello, as well as have a go at singing Elsa from Brabant, from Lohengrin, Eva Pogna, from the Meistersinger from Nuremberg, Elisabeth from Tannhäuser, Chocho San from Madame Butterfly, Liu from Turandot, Arabella from Richard Strauss's Arabella, Danae from the Liebe der Danae, and many other wonderful roles for either a lyric soprano or a spinto soprano. I'd also like to hear her sing Neda from Ipagliacci, as that role would be a nice fit for her. The possibilities for Olesya Golovneva to continue singing the full lyric slash spinto soprano roles are absolutely endless. She could definitely rock those roles so long as she manages to keep those chest tones intact and make sure that she does not give in to singing in a collapsed head voice because once she manages to keep on coordinating head voice and chest voice to the greatest of her abilities and when she also gets inspiration from the likes of Emmy Destin, Renata Tebaldi, Maria Callas, and even Carla Martinez, we would have at our disposal a very fine full lyric soprano who can sing a lot of roles from the Verismo repertoire as well as some works by Wagner, Strauss, and maybe even the likes of Yenufa by Janaszek and Katya Kabanova. Also striking again as the page boy Urbain was Irene Roberts. As much as I really, really loved her performance in this role as she was able to demonstrate how agile she was in terms of her voice as well as being a very committed singing actress. My tastes always prefer to have a light lyric or lyric coloratura soprano singing this role a la Adele Kern, Lotte Schöne, Fritzi Jokl, Tilly de Garmo, Jeanette Scovati, Anne-Marie MacDonald, Danielle Burst, and even what we've been having today with the likes of Zilka Evas, Carola Sofia Schmidt, and Hélène Lector. I always love it when a soubrette or a light lyric or even a lyric color to a soprano sings Orbe as it brings a whole lot of youthfulness and charm in stark comparison to Marguerite de Valois's dramatic coloratura soprano voice. However, all tastes aside, Irene Roberts continues to sell the goods as Urbain. She managed to be just as dedicated, committed, and absolutely charming as a singing actress, and her overall skills cannot be questioned. Sure, her chest tones could use a whole lot more beefing up, and her overall voice could use a whole lot more control, especially when she puts those chest tones to great use. Nevertheless, Irene Roberts was definitely a fine trooper who managed to sell the goods as Urbain, and she did so with vibrance, brilliance, and a whole lot of charisma. Then we get to the two lower voice male roles, starting off with Le Comte de Sombri, sung once again by Derek Welton. And boy, did his voice sound a whole lot more beefed up and more imposing as this father figure. He was definitely in his element when he sang that role with virility, strength, toughness, and so much guts in his system that I was practically having my eyes glued to him. He was absolutely brilliant in this role that he remained unparalleled 
as Le Comte de Saint-Brie. The virility found in the richness of his bass baritone voice, especially when he hits the lower notes, and that fierceness that he managed to embody as this father was really phenomenal all the way through. He definitely had me on the edge of my seat, and for that, I salute Mr. Welton for everything he accomplished as Le Cop de Saint-Prix. Striking again as Marcel, the old servant of Rol de Nangy, was Ante Yerkunitsa. And he also had me on the edge of my seat in terms of how he was able to use his basso cantante slash basso profondo voice. He was able to hit those depths really well and with much strength and endurance that my heart was practically melting like butter in an oven. That was just how spellbinding Mr. Yakunitsa was as Marcel. Oh sure, I also had in my ears the likes of Cesare Sieppi and Nikolai Gyaurov, whose voices were more focused and whose voices also had that signature metal I love in many a basso cantante. Nonetheless, I thought that Ante Yerkunitsa was an absolutely fine and wonderful Marcel that he also deserves an A plus for a job well done. Then we have Boise, sung by Andre Danilov. And boy, did he steal the show from almost everyone's feet, not only in the first act, but also with his Rataplan number with the soldier's chorus. His voice continues to grow in masculinity, virility, and beauty. And I definitely loved that chestiness that he has in his voice, which made him all the more awesome to listen to. His Rataplan number was that very moment which made me say he definitely grew from the first time I saw him as Rodolfo from La Boheme. He definitely grew in brilliance and in so much charisma that it also reflects on his voice. I cannot wait to see what the future has to offer for Mr. Danilov because that voice of his is going to go places. It is going to go the full lyric tenor route especially when it comes to singing more bel canto roles and even French roles, unless they forget about the German and Slavic roles. His voice has definitely shown in the best possible way, and it's reflected in that charisma he was able to embody and his manner and that masculinity which he was able to exude so well. There was even some equally wonderful singing to be found in Paul Kaufmann's lyrical Tavan, Jörg Schörner's characterful Cosset, Patrick Rowan's elegant Meru, Alexia Botnarschutz's virile Torre and Morever, Stephen Bronck's tall, handsome, and absolutely magnificent durettes, Timothy Newton's haunting Night Watchman, and Jacqueline Stucker's and Karis Tucker's gorgeously sung and absolutely brilliant Ladies in Waiting. And I should never, ever forget about Katarina Darga's wonderful efforts being put to great use with her playing of the Viola d'Amore in Roldunangi's solo aria. So overall, the singing was really well done. Even though I did have problems with Anton Rosicki in terms of how he emitted his voice, I still have to give him credit for what he was able to do in terms of his charisma as a singing actor. However, this evening definitely belonged to Liv Redpath as Marguerite de Valois. She was a star who shone so brilliantly and whose future and career show a lot of brilliance, potential in the best possible way, and a lot of 
promise. Not to mention the overall wonderful collaborative efforts from her fellow colleagues who managed to do equally great jobs, especially Olesya Golovneva, Irene Roberts, Ante Erkunitsa, Dimitris Tilyakos, Derek Welton, and Andre Danilov. And lest I even forget about the likes of Paul Kaufman, Stephen Bronk, Jörg Schörna, Alexia Botnarschuch, and Patrick Rowan, who also managed to bring a whole lot of virility to these Catholic gentlemen, and also the handsomely done efforts done by Timothy Newton, Jacqueline Stucker, and Karis Tucker for their contributions in the small roles of the Night Watchmen and the Ladies in Waiting. And the conducting done by Alexander Vedernikov was brilliant all the way through. Sure, it could have used a whole lot more beefiness in the orchestra and a whole lot more excitement, but he definitely kept the pace going on. He was really collaborative with both the orchestra and the singers. And of course, the chorus and orchestra of the Deutsche Oper Berlin were absolutely brilliant. So overall, with a fine role debut accomplished by Liv Redpath as La Reine Margot or Marguerite de Valois, plus some equally fine singing from her colleagues, most specifically Ante Arkunitsa, Derek Welton, Olesa Golovneva, and Andre Danilov, plus some really fine conducting to be accomplished by Alexander Vedernikov, tonight's performance of Les Huguenots was quite a treat to witness. If mainly for Liv Redpath, who stole the show as La Reine Marguerite de Valois. And for those of you who saw this particular production of Maya Bea's Les Huguenots at the Deutsche Oper Berlin, what did you think of it? Did you feel that Liv Redpath definitely stole the show as Marguerite de Valois? Was there another singer who stole her thunder, whether it be Anton Rosicki, Derek Welton, Ante Yerkunitsa, Andrei Danilov, Olesya Golovneva, and or Irene Roberts? Or did you feel like the singing was not your cup of tea? Comment below and let me know. Well, that's all for now. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for yet another review where I return to the Deutsche Oper Berlin to catch Alida Abend starring Alexandra Hutton, Karis Tucker, Clemens Biba, and Byunggil Kim. So until then, good night everybody and stay safe. Oh, and I also hope you all had a very wonderful International Women's Day.